I'm here with Julianne Romanello uh-huh. in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And um, Julianne, you want to just introduce yourself? Tell me a little bit about you. Sure. Well, um, I'm a mom of four and I used to be a teacher at the college level. I taught at several different institutions here in Tulsa um, at a community college, at a private liberal arts university, and my degree is in political philosophy. I studied um, the writings of Eric Vogelin and Plato, so I didn't start out to be a techno-fascist researcher or a researcher of techno-fascism. <laughs> and, but something happened. I had a, a, a concrete, specific event that made me ask a lot of questions, and then I found out a lot more than I ever wanted to about techno-fascism. <laughs> so what was that incident? What was it that caused you to, to um, kind of diverge? To go down the rabbit hole? Well, so I was teaching in the honors program at, at the University of Tulsa, and it's like a great books program. I was a visiting prof, and so I wasn't completely plugged in to the, you know, the everyday happenings at the university, but I was a full faculty member, and, and I actually did my undergrad at the university, so it had a special place in my heart as well. And in April of 2019, a restructure was organized, um, or I'm sorry, a restructure was announced. And I was there at the meeting. They called everyone in, all the faculty members, into a huge auditorium, and they said, okay, we're taking a completely different path. We're going to train, um, train students to, uh, for the 21st century workforce. And they used phrases like, you know, we all are rowing in unison. And we're going to, we're, you know, we need to have a measurable impact. Education, like students want value and a measurable impact. And I mean, it was just unbelievable to me. Like I can't, it, to go into the details would be too much, but for like immediately I knew that there was a big problem. And so I just started digging into it. You know, some of the things that they did, they, they were basically going to scale back the honors program. They were going to focus heavily on STEM and, you know, practical, like, professional uh, programs. And this is a university that had always been known for its liberal arts core, you know, and it was a staple of Tulsa. I mean, it was a top 100 school school at the time with a very large endowment so it was just really puzzling and I was a teacher of I had mainly like engineering students you know and math students like STEM students or science students in my honors classes and these were students who were studying the the sciences but also wanted you know a well-rounded education they wanted to you know be able to participate in this centuries-old conversation, and they were excellent at it. So I, I was just really confused. Like when you have students who are so enthusiastic about learning, why would you deprive them of that? You know. So anyway, that's how I started to to dig. Yeah. Wow. And um, what what was it that you found when you started to dig? <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I knew that. You know, we have, a, we have a couple of billionaires in, in Tulsa, you know, and I knew that they were heavily involved in education. And I found out that, you know, a lot of what was going on at the University of Tulsa was tied to um, a family foundation, George, the George Kaiser Family Foundation. So our, our provost at the time, now she's the interim university president. Her name is Janet Levitt. Well, her husband, Ken Levitt, is the CEO of the George Kaiser Family Foundation. And, you know, there were other people, like key people in Tulsa who were, you know, put on the board at TU and who were making these decisions. So, for example, the chairman of the board at TU was 
um, George Kaiser's pri uh, personal attorney, you know? I mean, these are people with a lot of clout. Um, I mean, there are articles that are published on this that show all of the, um, the connections. But anyway, so I knew that that was going on, and then I had sort of heard that, you know, that Kaiser was involved in the public schools because we they didn't have enough funding from the state, so we hear. So they, the public schools were dependent on grant monies. And we also have Educare, which is uh, it's a preschool program that is backed by like Warren Buffett, George Kaiser, a lot of billionaires back it. And not every city has that, but you know, I just started thinking, oh wow, we have, we have preschool, we have, um, you know, elementary school and high school, and then we have the university. So really, like, I, I wondered how many, you know, is there any, are there any educational institutions that, that weren't influenced by this, um, by philanthropy? You know, and I'm sort of simplifying that because, of course, we have a complex educational system and there are many different, you know, universities, colleges, junior colleges here. But, you know, the more I started to dig, the more I found out the same people are involved in all of them. And they were using the same language to talk about education. And it was, I mean, to me, you know, I'm a liberal arts major and I studied philosophy and I think you Education should be about learning, learning for its own sake, not, you know, just as a means to a career, although that's important too. But the way that everyone from, to use one of their buzzwords, cradle to career, the way that they were talking about education was very technical and it was all about impact. And that would become something that was really important you know, I found out that that was actually the crucial thing behind all of these restructurings. It was a concern for impact. So you're looking at this and you're, you're kind of questioning, yeah. you know, what, what does this all mean? This, you know, these, these buzzwords and, and these connections. Yeah, well, I mean, what was so striking was that the buzzwords were everywhere, you know, and it was the same set of buzzwords, collaboration, innovation, entrepreneurship, you know, impact, uh, 21st century global citizen, all of these things that, you know, I hadn't seen before because I was not, I'm not in the, I wasn't in the corporate world um, and I have four kids, so I sort of spent time with my kids and my books. It all, I mean, it, I, I just started typing in some of these words. And if you put in like reimagining education, you are taken to some sites that show how Google is talking about big data analytics and how that's so critical for higher education, um, you know, and, and then also for primary and secondary education. But, you know, I noticed that, there, that these terms weren't only in education, they were also in city initiatives that had to do with economic development and that led me to look at our regional chamber of commerce and there and then i found out they're heavily involved in education and you know I, I was naive i just had no clue before this but when you start looking at what like our regional chamber was doing they were inviting in huge foundations like the lumina foundation uh, to, to brief Tulsans on how our educational system should be changed to fit the needs of the 21st century workforce. Well, why is a big foundation like Lumina, which got its start um, by, I mean, it's money, it, it was student loan money that like funded Lumina Foundation. So it's got a strange history. Yeah, you can look back. Um, and find the dirt on that. People interpret it different ways. But why was a big foundation like Lumina coming in to talk about uh, like um, competency-based education and a P20 pipeline? And I had never heard that, you know, 
little term either, a P20 pipeline. And what that is, is that's preschool to PhD, a pipeline. Now, you know, I studied political philosophy and I studied language and I think, you don't talk about students as, you know, a commodity to be shipped through a pipeline, right? I mean, that, yeah. that's weird, don't you think? Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> you know, like a pipeline to the workforce. But, you know, that's what Lumina was talking about. And also, you know, so they want to seamlessly align all of these skills to, you know, some workforce that I would later find out was going to be like basically an engineered workforce. Mm. And so, so what's the, you know, if, if someone would say, well, yeah, but what's the problem? I mean, mm -hmm. you know, people need work and we're just trying to help them get through the system so they can find, find work so they can have a career and, and make money and, and. Yeah. I mean, first off, I should say, I have never thought that everyone should go to get a four-year degree. I think that it's actually, you know, it can do more harm than good for some people, right? Because they take out a lot of debt, maybe they don't finish, and, and that's what the line that you would hear from, say, Lumina Foundation too, but they want to revamp the system. I don't think that we should do away with four-year degrees that, te that, you know, encourage like academic and intellectual inquiry right, for its own sake. I don't think we should get rid of research degrees that aren't, um, you know, science and, um, and technology-based, or technology based, right? That said, like, what, when we hear these impact investors, and I'll, I can clarify that concept in a bit, but when we hear them talk about the workforce, they're talking about a planned workforce. And they're talking about putting people on a workforce track versus a university track um, without that person being able to decide for themselves, really, if he or she wants to go, you know, into a, a technical um, career or, or if they want to keep learning on their own. Like, this is all going to be really, like, the sectors of the economy that we're going to have, like in Oklahoma, it's cybersecurity, healthcare, aeronautics, agriculture, chemicals, I think, and some finance. So we have, like, five that are in our workforce development plan. Um, you know, what if you don't want to be in those? What if you don't want to work in those careers? Well our social engineers, they don't care, you know? And so what they they have established like the supply of professions that are available to people, and then they're gonna channel you in based to one of those professions based on your aptitude. And you're not even gonna know it's happening. A lot of this sounds kind of like, like, you know, planned economies kind of like, you know, mm -hmm. old Soviets, you know, they had the planned economy. Yeah. And we think of ours, ours as being more organic and, you know, people coming up with great yeah. ideas and, you know, starting a business. But this, this does kind of smell of like old school planned economies. Yeah. Com command and control economies. I think that's exactly what it is. And if we're looking at how COVID has impacted, you know, our lives, then we're going to see. Who, like, who's lost out? You know, it's a lot of small businesses that don't fit within that, you know, the workforce development plan for, say, Tulsa, you know? Um, and those small businesses, I mean, you know, they give people some freedom. They give people some humanity, some choice, right? But if the goal of these workforce development plans is to really concentrate on a few areas and it's to align a workforce uh, to those areas so that there's no waste, right? No waste of human capital. Then we need to cut off other options. And if you look at like our state, you know, plans for education, we have the one Oklahoma plan and we have several plans that are specific to higher education. Then they talk about how students 
need to be prepared to meet the needs of business and industry. So our educational system, our public systems, and even, you know, I worked at a private university that was taken over, basically. Uh, you know, those are being designed to support, uh, you know, this planned economy, like you say. And, and our social engineers don't want any alternatives. Like, what if you, you know, you have um, someone who doesn't want to go into healthcare, cyber, cybersecurity, or drone research? Say they want to be an artist. Well, you know, I think part of this, you know, part of the approach that the social engineers have taken through COVID is to limit the opportunities available to, say, a musician. You know, you just get rid of that supply. Well, another thing that I think about, about the direction that society's been headed even before COVID, but obviously ramped up since, you know, this year, is that it's it's people's real ownership. You know, I remember that, you know, politicians talking about an ownership society. And even back then I thought, I think they're talking about them owning society, not everybody else having some sort of stake in it. Even yeah. though now they use terms like stakeholder capitalism. But at the end of the day, if you actually look at what is happening on the ground, is people are losing their, um, their autonomy, their actual ownership of anything. You know, basically you own a debt. Yeah. You have a house, you, you don't really own your house, um, a mortgage, you, you own a mortgage. The bank is holding the title on your house. And a lot of people, as, as the debt increases, is, are never going to pay off that home. They're going you know, to be trapped in that for a long time. Yeah. Um, and and but, but what that means is you don't really have any power. Like, I mean, it, this country was created initially, it was just landowners, you know, had the right to vote and they extended it to everybody else because they realized, oh, we can manipulate this thing anyways. So we don't really, who cares if they have the right to vote? We just make sure they don't have any real power. Yeah. Make them make them have like a pretend power. Um, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, you know, I'm a political theorist, so I've read some Thomas Hobbes, and it sounds exactly like Thomas Hobbes to me. Mm. You know, it sounds like you. You know, one of one thing that's in Thomas Hobbes is you know you redefine everything. You tell people that they're free, and then they. You know, they they ignore the fact that they are actually enslaved. You know, that just the situation that you're describing, and I think that that's where all of these buzzwords come in. We're collaborating. We're innovating. Um, you know, you're an entrepreneur. No, not really. I mean, so there's so much like abusive language going on to disguise the very fact that that we have lost power. You know, because no one knows what's going on here. No one knows where the money is going. No one knows, you know, how, like, how many different international foundations are involved in, like, you know, their local school board's decision making. You ever read Leviathan? Yeah. It's relevant. Yeah. I mean, it's funny. I think it's exactly the same. And Hobbes even says, you know, it's just like the Athenians, you know, you tell them they're, that they're free so that they don't rebel, you know? It is wild how much, how far a lot of this stuff goes back. I mean, yeah. in terms of tactics and structures and whatnot, and, and, you know, not even to get into that, but even just some of the actual families and individuals that, yeah. that, are, that somehow are, are continue to, to be the quote unquote rulers of the world. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, I mean, I think that that's one reason why you have to destroy things like the liberal arts and you have to stop teaching people history because then you, you know, you see a pattern. And I mean, I had been teaching, you know, the Enlightenment and its critics when this restructure was announced at my university. So I'd been reading, you know, Condorcet and Hobbes, you know, just, just before all of this happened, it was fresh. But that's what we're taking away. It feels like, you know, I've done a little bit of reading of history as well, and it's like there's always been these efforts by um, individuals and groups to 
kind of like literally rule the whole world. Like no one's ever been able to really do it because there's always been some competition. But it seems like the, you know, for lack of a better word, the elites or whatever somebody wants to call them, mm -hmm. um, the people that are, that are, you know, controlling and manipulating things are, are more on the same page than they've probably ever been before in history where there's, you know, at least before they were like competing powers that they would fight it out. And there doesn't seem to be much real opposition in terms of like, there's another power that's like, even, you know, so they, they, the, even the China Russia thing versus the U S you know, or the, it, it, even that almost doesn't seem like that real. And it just, it seems like, yeah. They're still cooperating, I think, far more than they're competing. But they are competing. But but they're 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 still all pushing us towards the same same outcome. Yeah, I think a lot of that has to do with the mass media and TV. You know, Alan Bloom wrote a book that was published in 1987, I think, the closing of the American mind, and. I mean, he wasn't the first one to say this, but he talks about the influence of TV and how you could broadcast things to so many people in the privacy of their home, of homes. And I think there's a lot to be said for the importance of that because, you know, we all start to use the same language. We all start to speak with the same, you know, there's the Midwest neutral accent. Um, I'm sure that that works on the elites too, you know, and we have, and the technology is finally there. And, and I, one thing that I was really surprised about was how far advanced the different, you know, surveillance fields, like bioengineering fields, nanotechnology, I was blown away with how advanced these are. And I even remember listening to an NPR article like several years ago that said most people have no clue how, <laughs> how far along science is, right? Well, they were right. No, people don't know. You know, there's smart dirt now. Smart dirt. <laughs> That's a thing. That's crazy. Yeah, smart um. dirt. <laughs> Although I think regular dirt is pretty smart if you think about all the <laughs> microbiology <laughs> that's going on in there. It's smarter. But I uh, think. <laughs> <laughs> but we have a you know it's it's about control at the end of the day and mm -hmm. and, and that type of system isn't really sustainable. I mean it, it just it seems madness because you know you have this this fictional world um, trying to control and own everything very arrogantly thinking that, that that's even, that, that you can compete with nature. But I, I mentioned to someone the other day about, you know, you have these two competing systems. Um, one is real and one is not. Yeah. And one can survive without the other. One, the other cannot survive without the other. You know what I mean? Like nature can survive on its own. Right. The technology and these systems that we're putting into place cannot survive on nature even though we're destroying nature to build them. I mean, it's complete insanity. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, the World Economic Forum says, you know, in the fourth industrial revolution, like the, the distinction between what's real and what's, I don't know, I can't remember if they say virtual or artificial, but that's going to be blurred. And I think that's a, that is a huge thing to lose to lose an understanding of that distinction because then we can't evaluate like a hierarchy of reality to make judgments like you just did. And it's all happening without any public discussion or debate, which is really interesting. I mean, it's just, it's just, it's moving forward and then people talk about it as if it's inevitable. Yeah. You know, like this is just, you do it because you can do it. And why would you not do it? Because you can do it. That's what, you know, I mean, I think that that is a sign of bad faith, honestly. You know, I mean, I think if these elites, social engineers, if they really believe that this was good for all people, you know, they wouldn't have to make up 
community engagement strategies that fool people. You know, they would be honest and they would say, hey, you know, we're heading toward a technocracy <laughs> and we're going to track and trace everything and we're going to measure little kids and we're going to, you know, evaluate their aptitudes and we're going to see which of the workforce sectors they best fit into and we're going to put them there. I mean, that would be honest. And they give us clues in their white papers on their websites, but it's not honest, it's not direct. They really don't care. And, and that's because they know that it's gonna harm us. And if we really understood what was going on, we would all be up in arms. Some of the language that they use, they talk about educational ecosystems. Uh -huh. And um, what does that mean? In well, you know, I kept, again, I kept, that was a, a buzzword that I kept seeing. Ecosystem, 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 which of course I came to find out that's linked to Agenda 21 and the whole uh, climate change initiative, which whether you are on board with climate change or not, I think everyone who looks at the evidence can see that that's being used to facilitate um, the technocratic transformation of all of our of all of our social and political systems right someone can believe that we're we're causing climate change but also recognize that the the companies and the foundations and these power brokers that are you know using that as a talking point to push forward these these policies which actually are not and not environmental at all right yeah, you can, you know, you can come at it from that angle and you can absolutely see that, you know, it, it, this is, I mean, it's a policy area that is, it's global, you know, and it is ambiguous enough that it can be manipulated by people who want to establish a one world government and track and trace every single person. So, yeah, so beside like the issue of whether or not climate change is caused by human beings or real or anything like that, um, the, the social, engineer, social engineers, um, the technocrats, they call themselves technocrats. Um, you know, they like to use the terms that remind us of that climate change agenda. So anyway, I saw ecosystems being used in in terms of our educational systems and what that means here in Tulsa. And we're a test market city, we're a beta city. We have a lot of impact pilots. So probably if it's happening, you know, here, we're, we're gonna get it first or, you know, close to first and then other, it's gonna roll out the same way in other cities. So we have a, a, a collective impact group called Impact Tulsa and they evaluate different ecosystems. They do education. Um, but they've all, I think they've also participated in a workforce ecosystem study, you know, studies funded by, or administered by Harvard and funded by our billionaires. And, and Bloomberg and other billionaires, Gates, they, they all participate. So, this ecosystem, it's, it feeds into the idea of a circular economy, and that's where there's absolutely no waste. Well, the way that, that our technocrats ensure that there's no waste is by perfectly fitting every single piece of the human capital, um, like the fullness of reality, really. And they want to fit, they want to track and trace, measure each piece of that and fit it into a new thing so that you can, you can have, well, how do I explain that? I, didn't, I don't know if I said that right. So an ecosystem, it's gonna supply itself, basically. It's gonna be, you know, you're gonna create the type of people that you need and you're gonna need the type of people that you create. And there's really no escape to it. Like, there's no escape. Sounds fun. <laughs> <laughs> and so you started speaking out on, on 
some of these things? You, 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 you wrote some articles and you... Yeah, I mean, once I got into it, you know, the, the faculty at the university where I worked, you know, they put up a pretty good fight. And it waxed and waned, you know, um, and I fought with them for a long time, even though my contract wasn't going to be renewed, but I stayed on with the fight because I had a lot of information and because I felt so strongly about it. So, you know, a lot of the faculty members thought I was crazy and <laughs> they called me a tinfoil hat and I said, look, this is about blockchain surveillance and you have to have you know, you have to have the latter part of the P20 pipeline. And I said, this is ideological because TU was being transformed into a major cybersecurity hub um, in partnership with venture capital firms from Israel. And so TU is Tulsa University? Yes, yes, the University of Tulsa, which interestingly, they did a sort of brand shift and started calling it Tulsa's with a possessive university. It was interesting. They put the city flag on the university, like um, on some pennants that they had attached to lampposts. I thought, how do you not see this, right? It's like, it's like colonialism. <laughs> but anyway, so, so I started to, you know, I knew that I wasn't going to work at TU again because I had spoken out about this. We had student rallies, and I would say a lot of things because I could. You know, I, I didn't really have anything to lose. Um, I spoke at our school board when I saw that the same thing that was happening at the university was happening at the public schools, and I went to the school board and I said, look, like, you're, you're trying to pass this transcendental meditation program. Well, you know, it's about soothing trauma, but wait, you've just traumatized people, so this looks like an impact study to me. And, and I mentioned names, and people were always shocked, and they would gasp. And I wrote some article, I wrote an article for the Tulsa Star, which was a paper that served the North Side, and it was called George Kaiser's Social Impact Philanthropy. And I talked about how, you know, Kaiser is an investment partner with Michael Bloomberg, and he's involved in a number of impact investing ventures. And, you know, we have a pay for success uh, act on the books in, in Oklahoma. It's a state uh, statute. In 2019, it was passed. And one of the sponsors for one of the pay for success bills that was passed. There were several introduced, but one was um, a representative, Monroe Nichols, who's on the board of Strive Together, which is a huge, you know, impact investing educational ecosystem convener based out of uh, Cincinnati. Um, you know, you saw a lot of collusion, and I, and I tried to expose that. And I mean, I had a lot of people say that I was, you know, anti-Semitic, or you know, that I was a nut job. But I don't know. When you see where they're going with this, you just really don't care. Yeah, and as far as the anti-Semitic thing, it's just because you're you're raising the fact that, you know, there is these there are these Israeli companies. Is that what? Yeah, well, I mean, George Kaiser is Jewish, mm -hmm. and, you know, so I, I went after him because he was, oh. he owns the bank that owned, or that managed to use endowment, Bank of Oklahoma. And he was, it's his foundation, who the now president of the university, like, um, her husband is the CEO of his foundation, George Kaiser's foundation. So the, and there was, like, so much nepotism and, you know, just conflicts of interest, right? So I went after him because he, he was so instrumental in the, in the restructure of TU. And then I found out, oh, well, it's his money that is, you know, messing up our public schools. And then, oh, wait, we have all of these other programs that are, that are all funded by Kaiser, his name's on everything. So, and he's Jewish. And you weren't attacking him because he's Jewish. No. 
Yeah, you were just like, yeah. It's... No, I mean, you know, when I was at the, at, when I first heard of this, like how the restructure was going to happen, I thought, you know, they're using the language that was used around the time of World War II. You know, when you talk about putting students through a pipeline, I mean, you know, that's the same kind of, of language that denies humanity. That's the same kind of language that was used before the Holocaust. And there's a lot of different organizations here. I mean, you've got um, uh, Impact Tulsa, mm -hmm. Educare. Educare, yeah, that's an early childhood education program. You know, if, if you understand the impact investing world, you know, they make money off of, of measurable impacts that are, you know, deemed to be good for society. And they loosely or sometimes not so loosely align with the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So, you know, you might come up with an impact program that's going to teach children how to be more resilient, say. And if, if you have these impact interventions, if you start early, like in preschool, then there's a higher return on your investment in terms of future cost offset for society. So um, Educare is, you know, they run a lot of pilot programs to test interventions that could potentially be scalable at a national level to accomplish these social goals and also generate a, a kind of a return for the investor who pays for it. So how does that work? Uh, the, as an investor in, invests in, in the organization or? Yeah, I mean, you know, they usually provide the upfront cost of administering some program. And it really, I think if you, if you want to talk about social impact finance and social impact investing, you have to do it, you really need to look at pay for success contracts. And like I said, Oklahoma has a pay for success act and we have two active pay for success programs. One is women in recovery, which is a program to keep uh, women out of jail after they have served their time, you know, is to keep a lower recidivism rates. And then another has to do with, um, I want to say it's maybe foster care. It has something to do with, with childhood issues. It's in Oklahoma City. Anyway, pay for, what a pay for success con, how a pay for success contract works is a private funder, and it could be a philanthropic funder or a corporate investor, they're going to provide the money to, to administer a program that's going to generate a positive social return. And that program will be, it, it will be administered by a nonprofit organization. And if that, if that program, if it meets certain success metrics that have been agreed upon in the contract, then the taxpayers will end up reimbursing the investor for the initial um, outlay of the funds. And then where's the, where does the profit come into play? Well, you know, it's complicated. So it depends how the contract is set up, but sometimes so, you know, there might be a success payment that's negotiated into the contract where say if a corporate investor is, is paying the money up front then they might receive some kind of a, a fixed rate of return you know that like kind of like interest um, but i think the real profit well there are two ways uh, there are a couple of different ways of talking about it so um, you know, impact investors sell their programs to the public, you know, to mayors and governors, by saying that the public is going to save money on these uh, future costs, right? So it looks like it's a, a win for the taxpayer. 
but a lot of times the way that that the social impacts are defined, they're defined in the best interest of these investors. You know, it's creating a workforce that's going to be, um, that's going to benefit the employer, like the investor, right? Um, but then also another area of profitability that we don't want to talk about is the access to the data. Because if you have an investor who is, is putting up so much money, millions of dollars, to run a program, and they don't, they, there's the potential that they won't get paid back if the, pro, if the program doesn't hit its targets. Um, then that investor is going to be able to monitor everything. Like he's going to have a financial interest, uh, you know, in looking at how the progress is going, and all of that becomes a part of like a matter of record. All that human behavioral data. So when you have a private investor, you know, backing these social programs then they get a lot of very valuable data. What's Strive together? That, well, Strive is the impact, it's a huge collective impact group. Um, and we have one of our state representatives is on the national board with, is it Connie Balmer, married to Steve Balmer, Microsoft. Um, you know, they're in Cincinnati and they facilitate the cradle career to career alignment. And it's a community schools model that brings wraparound services into the schools, mental health, um, criminal justice sometimes for students or parents, um, just regular health care and education. You know, everything is brought within or like say under the roof of the schools and all of the data is collected. So Strive Together, they have a data sharing policy. I mean, that's what collective impact is. It aligns all of their objectives, it establishes like common metrics and data sharing agreements. And also too, it's, it's like in addition to, you know, making profit off of the system, they're also having, um, they're getting to steer it in the direction that they want, as opposed to um, what other, you know, what they would call stakeholders, the stakeholders who don't actually have a say in, a real say in it. Sure, yeah. I mean, they're only going to offer programs that, you know, produce the kinds of people that they want for the workforce that's been decided by, by whom? By the Chamber of Commerce? By the elites by, we don't know. And off camera, you, you stated that it was basically, um, co is, how did you word it, you corporate? It's corporate training paid for by the taxpayers, yeah. you know? So, you know, you have, you have, let's say parents who are paying to turn their children into cogs in the, industrial machine it's great and this the same kind of mentality goes back i think about some of the films that were coming out in the silent era the, yeah. from metropolis to the modern times with charlie chaplin and yeah. this is like this this machine that 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 uses people up but there's it's sold a different way though it's sold as you know entrepreneurship and independence and yeah but it's i mean it's not like branding, marketing, and they use a lot of fancy terms like entrepreneurship that sounds like you're going out on your own and creating something new. Um, but it's really not about that. It's about marketing yourself. And whenever you're in, involved in marketing yourself, you're adapting to the preferences of your audience, right? And we all do that as human beings. We need to to get along. But this is about doing that constantly. Your whole life is going to be conforming to the tastes and preferences of, you know, of a community that's also been really 
shaped, indoctrinated by those same tastes and preferences. So we see, you know, that's one of the things that I noticed at the very beginning was this, you know, constriction of language. We're losing, we're, we're losing vocabulary even, you know? I, I mean, I would challenge anyone to watch 30 minutes of TV at, with, and you're gonna hear the term impact. You know, if you go to a board meeting, you're gonna hear the term impact, collaboration, innovation, all of it. It's just over and over again. And that's the, you know, the, the sign of propaganda where you keep hearing the same terms, the same, you know, same formulations, just repeated over mm -hmm. and over again. And it's, it's anti-thought, yeah. really. It's brainwashing, <laughs> it's programming, you know? And that's what they're doing in the schools. And they have to, you know, all of the standards have to be aligned. The curriculum has to be aligned. Everything has to be aligned it, with collective impact. You know, you have to speak in the same terms, agree on the same measurements. Why? I mean, I don't, I think human life is richer and more beautiful the more complex and diverse it is, but not so. So how does this relate to austerity, failing public services, creating poor? This is, yeah. Allison talks a lot about this, but what are your, what are your, kind of what's your take on all of that? Yeah, so, you know, looking at Tulsa, um, you know, we're really, we're a captured city. And as I was trying to understand this, you know, I thought, you know, our billionaires tend to lean left, let's say. Like, you know, people think of them as like being more progressive on social issues, okay? I mean, that's, it's a starting point for getting a feel for how they are. But, you know, um, it's, and it's always gotta be refined. But looking at how, you know, our progressive leaning billionaires have taken over a city in a red state was very interesting to me because Oklahoma is a red state. You know, we always vote red. Um, so I thought, why aren't, you know, I mean, I was really concerned about preserving education, but I thought, why aren't people like seeing, why isn't the right standing up to this guy who is taking over a good liberal arts school? And, you know, one of the things that I noticed was that really Oklahoma was a perfect place to begin play, uh, programs like this because we had a conservative base that wasn't, you know, they weren't keen on funding government programs. So all of these government programs were going to fail because they weren't adequately funded. I mean, there are lots of reasons, right? But that's a, a big one. So where you have an unwillingness of taxpayers to pay for a government program, you're creating an opportunity for a private investor to come in and fill the gap with a grant that has strings attached. So, you know, conditions of austerity are, are gonna give rise to this. And the, you know, social impact finance thrives on poverty. It's, it starts with the poor, you know, it starts in the poor minority communities because they can't organize and fight against it. And, you know, then it creates conditions of misery that are always going to need to be fixed. Like, you know, they'll move the needle enough to hit this, the success metrics, you know, to accomplish the pay for success contract, but you never want to fix the problem. You always want to keep enough misery, enough poverty, enough of, a, you know, an improvable situation that you can keep that funding mechanism going. That's what sustainable development is. It's sustainable economic development for impact investors. It's interesting because um, I, I don't really, the, the left right thing, you know, the more I study it, it's just like the more meaningless it is in yeah. terms of, you know, progressive because what's what's progressive i mean if you actually look at what they actually do a lot of the stuff that they do is not progressive in my my mind right and um 
and I think we need to like take back our language around even the politics of these things too, because people have these, they hear a word and they're like, oh, are you a good guy or a bad guy? Are you a, are you a progressive or are you Republican? Or are you liberal? Or are you Democrat? And then they just put you into this pigeonhole category and then a conversation never happens. Right. And if those conversations were to happen, I think um, the lines would end up being redrawn. Yeah. And uh, I think that needs to happen. But, um, but I think that's exactly what is not going to happen. I mean, this system, you know, the educational system, like the co-opting of the arts and cultural scenes in cities, like, you know, it's designed to prevent discussion that is going to, you know, help us understand these phenomena in a nuanced way, you know? And it's interesting because so I am in Oklahoma, it's a red state. I, you know, I would say that before I became woke, <laughs> I sort of, I sort of leaned right, but I felt like I was a nice right, you know, like we want to, you know, I didn't want to defund, you know, government. We want government to do good things, right? So I was sort of middle of the road. Um, but I'm in Oklahoma and we have to gather people together. I mean, I think we have to gather people together locally to try to stop this. And so we do have to build actual consensus. And, you know, so when I talk to people, a lot of times like people will say, oh, well, this is communism. This is socialism. Or, you know, those, you know, people are far, they're right wing nut jobs. And as much as I can, you know, I try to not argue with people's labels, you know, because you don't want to pick a fight right now because we don't have time to. And, and I try to sometimes refine things and maybe shift the dialogue toward using terms like technocracy, you know, or, um, you know, what's another techno fascism, but, but really, I think we need to have these nuanced discussions. But before we can do that, we need to gather consensus and sort of let everyone in that is willing to fight um, and fight it so that we can have room, have a space, you know, and, you know, to preserve that. Because that conversation is going to take a long time. Yeah, for sure. And what we have happening right now, like you said, is it's where this is a crisis. Yeah. Uh, this is the crisis of all crisis. <laughs> yeah. You know, if we don't, what happens in the next couple of years is going to determine our future for a very long time. And, and if, if, if they get their way with this new technocracy, it's going to be really hard to break free from. It's going to be awful. I mean, you know, what are our kids going to do? I mean, I think I have four young kids and I've pulled them out of my kids had gone to private school. I pulled them out to homeschool. Well, you know, their human capital scores are going to be skewed. I mean, you know, their, their human capital scores are going to be affected by everything that I've said online. They're going to be affected by everything I've done. Um, and where are they going to be put? You know? I have a daughter who is artsy and I mean, she's got many talents, but I think, you know, she goes, sometimes I've taken her to the museum and right now, if you look at our museums, it's tending all toward pop art, modern art, experiential, you know, immersive experiences, things like that. And a lot of it is just, um, the art is like it's picking a fight with you to deconstruct any of your ideas of what art might have been. So my young daughter, like, has, she had a reaction to this stuff. She's like, I don't like that, you know? And if she wants to be an artist, she's got to like that. Do you even know much about the gathering place? Because she was, I was going to go check out the gathering place. But I oh, yeah, you should check it out. I mean, but how does that tie in with all this stuff? Does I mean, it's I just a data collection, like, yeah. I mean, I think that there's a lot of surveillance there. I mean, it, you know, the whole place is really weird. I, you know, my gut 
I just, I don't want to go there. I don't want to take the kids. It's not made for families, you know. It's made for, say, two parents and one child or two parents and two children going. But it's, you know, if a mom of four young kids, you can't really take them. Um, it looks like a sort of a fantasy world. And I've heard that there's some, like, the land that it's built on has a strange history. And that's, I haven't dug into that myself, but I've heard that there are stories, you know, it, it's a significant place. But I think in, I don't know if you would call it a public speech, but talking to a group of, of businessmen in town, George Kaiser, who funded it, he said that, you know, all the park equipment has a weight limit, and that's on purpose. You know, it's like a 250 pound weight limit. And that was to encourage people to be physically fit, right? Mm -hmm. On the one hand, that can sound okay. But on the other hand, it's kind of sneaky, isn't it? Yeah. You know, you're making a park for people, but you know, but only you have to be under 250 pounds to use the equipment or you don't get the privilege. Yeah, discriminate. Yeah, and there are a lot of, I mean, the public-private partnerships that went on to make that park happen, you know, it's hard to know who owns it. You know, we had River Parks, which was a public-private partnership that entered into a public-private partnership with Kaiser Foundation, which, you know, then there are other corporations that have donated, so no one knows who owns the place. And that's happening to a lot of our common areas. And you can tell with, co I mean, you know, to bring this to COVID, um, you know, now our libraries, you have to sign up online to go in, you know? our zoos, our like aquariums, all sorts of different public spaces. You have to log in online. If there's an admissions fee, you have to pay with a credit card. So I don't think those don't seem like public places anymore. And what are opportunity areas? Well, opportunity zones, I forget, and they're created by a federal act, and I can't remember when, which act that was or what year, but they give tax breaks to corporations, investors to develop distressed areas. And there are all sorts of incentives that flow into opportunity zones. And we have, uh, we, here we have promise neighborhoods and we have choice neighborhoods and those are partnerships with the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. And you know, basically big investors can come in and redevelop those areas. Well, the, first, the city usually blights the area and people are, you know, kicked out of their homes. How do they blight the area? How do they do it? Well, they look at, you know, some sort of measure and it says, well, is this area in decay? Are property values going up or down? Is it taken care of? You know, does it you know, does it look nice? Is this a, a healthy neighborhood? And I think people have, people disagree about what that means. I mean, we've had, I think, three, three areas here in, um, in Tulsa that have had major eminent domain de declarations and this, they've turned into controversies and they've all been ultimately uh, aimed at economic development. And what that means is stack and pack housing, you know, like <laughs> different smart um, place-based initiatives that are gonna collect data, they're gonna, you know, encourage the kinds of, um, you know, job creation that suits our impact investors. So what we have is just a really hand, a small handful of people who are, you know, taking over all the decision-making power from local communities and local cities, yeah, and and really just t it's kind of a, it's a takeover that's happening all over the world, really, yeah, and it's it's the same, it's a, and they're using the same 
same exact models in every place. So it, it like seems like that's the goal. Yeah. Um, you know, template. They have a template, and they just you know. A playbook. A playbook. Exactly. Or a toolkit. Yeah. And they do that, and they do that through, you know, economic development councils. They do it through um, task forces. They do it through community engagement strategies. And all of those sound nice, you know? And they say, we've in invited like leaders from business, leaders from the community to participate. But those people are usually hand selected, you know, to go along with whatever program is gonna be up for vote or approval, you know? So uh, I think it's Rosa Corey who talks a lot about this shift from representative government to corporate governance. And that's exactly what we're seeing. And so what does the alternative look like? What is, you know, what does it look like for um, the type of setup that you would appro approve of and appreciate? Well, I mean, I don't know. I think, you know, really we have to have we have to have individuals and communities who are taking responsibility for the for government. You know, we have to stay vigilant. We have to hold our leaders accountable, and we have to say, "Hey, no way! There are laws that prevent this." You know, in some cases, if they haven't been changed or amended by regulations, and we have to, you know, really assert our voice again before it's too late. Well, and what's interesting is there are these radical, massive changes that are happening without any discussion, without any debate. And there's lots of money that's being created for this process. Yeah. Um, just been reading, just, you know, been reading up about Bretton Woods too, which is just, that's kind of a new thing for me. I didn't, you know, I know I've heard them talk about a new Marshall Plan, you know, global Marshall Plan, but um, I don't know if you saw, Allison's been posting. I saw a little bit about that too. Yeah, mm -hmm. so it's, it's and I'm like, you would think that this would be a news story. <laughs> no. But I mean, one of the things that's that's allowing a lot of this to happen, particularly this year, and I think it's not, it's I think it's by design, mm -hmm. um, which is the the whole COVID crisis. Right. And so, do you want to you want to talk about how? So you were you were researching all these things before COVID happened, mm -hmm. and then COVID happened, and you know how did that affect your understanding of things and and your yeah, so, you know, I went, I got into researching by looking at education. And, you know, even before I understood about pay for success finance, I saw that education technology, you know, screen time, digital learning, web based learning, that that was a major factor in what was going on. So, you know, all of these ed tech companies were making huge investments in, in, our educational systems. And, you know, as I, you know, got into the why of that, at first I thought that they just wanted new markets and to sell, you know, to get licenses and renewals and secure an income stream like that, revenue stream. But then when I understood about data mining and pay for success contracts and, you know, training AI algorithms, you know, then I understood, no, the goal of, of the systems transformation in education and in other sectors, in healthcare especially, you know, it was to get everyone on a screen to be uh, surveilled and then also to train AI algorithms. And so that was the end game of, it, of the education reimagining. Well, when COVID hit, what happened? All of a sudden, the whole world is doing everything on a screen. Education, every bit of it went to distance learning. You know, tell, we had telemedicine through Zoom. We had, you know, all sorts of remote work. And, you know, the end game of what I had been looking at of education reform was the product of COVID. And then, you know, as I had learned about like Agenda 21 and, and you know, land reclamation, and you see that now everyone is working from their homes. Well then, office buildings become unnecessary. 
schools, school buildings become unnecessary, doctor's offices, churches, it all becomes, you know, that real estate could be bought up by, say, you know, Blackstone, and it could be repurposed, you know, for e-commerce, that's what Blackstone is involved in, e-commerce warehouses, or it could just be turned into, you know, wildlife reservation. What, um, what is Agenda 21? Well, that's the, uh, the program for uh, sustainable development. It's uh, the goals for the 21st century that's put forth by the United Nations. Um, and, you know, those goals include things like, you know, like protecting the planet and, you know, promoting equality among, gen you know, different genders. There are 17 sustainable development goals, and those come from agenda, or the 2030 agenda, which is really just um, an elaboration of Agenda 21. And on the surface, it sounds good, you know, like sure. we, we want equality, we want to protect the planet. Yeah. Um, but there's there's other there's other things about that 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 are not, um, you know, a lot of people don't realize aren't that are part of the bargain. That right. I mean, Agenda 21 came out of the 1992 um, Rio Earth Summit. Actually, it was from the Brundtland Commission had put forth a report before the Rio summit. Um, <clears throat> so the so Agenda 21 came out of a conference that was dedicated to like you know environmentalism, protecting the environment, and we hear the word sustainable development. Well, we think that they're talking about sustaining the the Earth's resources, natural resources, but really it's about sustainable economic development and how you can decouple economic growth from the use of limited uh, natural resources. So, you know, what our social engineers are really trying to do is move us all to the virtual world, you know, to have each human being take up as little space and as little planetary resources as possible but without compromising economic growth models for investors. And how do you do that? Well, it's sort of by slapping a pair of VR goggles on everyone <laughs> and letting them, you know, live out their whole lives in an artificial world. Crazy. And, you know, it's wild. Is I know yes. people that like, would like that. <laughs> which is fine you yeah. want you want to live in that world that's fine but you know i actually you know appreciate the natural world and um you know i don't i don't want to lose access to it and i don't want it to go away either yeah i mean i think once you lose the distinction between what's real and what's not then you have no you have no bearings for anything else. You have no way to measure anything else. How do you say what's right, what's wrong, what's just, what's unjust? You know, how do we say that this is a fact and this isn't? Like, we're totally in limbo. And I don't know, I mean, I'm sort of old school and I think with Aristotle that all human beings desire to know, right? Like, we want to know where we are and we want to make sure we're doing the right thing. And how do, you, how do you do that if you have no touchstone of reality? Yeah. And also a, 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 an augmented or virtual reality that is created largely by, you know, capital, you know, driven corporations. Yeah. And so, you know, there's an ideology and there's a, you know, kind of a stagnant, sort of way of looking at the world that's that's very sterile yeah um that you know like i said i don't i'm not that's not the kind of world that i'm i want to be a part of but i mean it's it's moving forward and so back to the covid thing mm -hmm. so you know covid happens and obviously they're it's they're, they're using this to pass a lot of the legislation and get people in line and get people to support all this stuff and and then so you you know how did so how did you respond to that I mean, I just thought it was nuts. 
you know? <laughs> I mean, on a personal level, you know, my kids, our school went to distance learning and I said, I'll do, I'll do the things that aren't online, you know? Because I had already talked to our school about, you know, we don't want kids to be doing anything online. It looks benign, spelling city, yeah, da, da, da. No, it's still not, you know? Um, so I really was just blown away when it first happened. But, you know, I tried to argue, um, I mean, I've tried, I try to explain to people like what, how this works, like the technocracy aspect of it. But then I tried to fight for uh, business owners' rights and to reopen the state. So like we had an automobile rally where people f all from all over Oklahoma, tr you know, we drove to the Capitol and like drove around the Capitol building and honked and had signs and stuff. We s social distance, which I mean, I think that's, ridiculous, you know, as a matter of principle. But if this was early in the beginning, and so people were trying to be respectful. So I fought, you know, I fought to try to, you know, keep our, you know, our workplaces open because people need to be able to provide for themselves. And I could see that this was narrowing the opportunities for, you know, people to be employed in industries or businesses any kind of enterprise that was outside of the workforce development plan of our state. And the result of it too is just that, you know, as people don't have incomes and they lose their businesses, it makes them dependent yeah. and it makes them less ability. They're, they're less able to resist any of the changes that they may disagree with because they, you know, they're going to need to have that UBI or whatever kind of assistance, you know, CARES Act or whatever assistance that's going to come yeah. Um, you know, it, it, it takes people's power away from them. At the end of the day, that's really what's what's happening. There's this massive shift of power away from people to these, you know, handful of corporations and oligarchs and that people can't see this. Yeah. They can't see beyond COVID is just really mind boggling to me. Yeah. I mean, it's the, the same people that are handing out the UBI, you know, or proposing the UBI are the ones who created the conditions that make the UBI necessary. So you, you know, you, you've been, you've been at this, this fight. <laughs> yeah. And um, so what, what's your, what's your hope for, you know, this year and, you know, the coming, the coming months, I mean, it's going to be, we're, we're going into winter now and, uh, you know, it's, it's going to get crazy, but what, what is your hope for people that are watching this? You know, what would you, what would you say to them? And I, I mean, my hope is that people, will take the time to look at the research that's out there, that you'll at least go to the World Economic Forum's website and see that they have a program called The Great Reset. And, you know, they talk about COVID like it's a, an historic opportunity to completely restructure human life as we know it. You know, just look at it. They're not hiding it. And then with that knowledge, um, get angry, get hopeful, get um, active and fight it, you know, because I think, I mean, really, I don't even think our money matters, you know, like where we buy, you know, who we buy from. I don't think that that matters. I, I think really what we're gonna have to do is as a people, as a community, is join together and say, this is, this is tyrannical, it's oppressive, it hurts children. Um, this is, it's totally dehumanizing and we're gonna say no. And we really have to get together and you pressure people at the local level um, and we say no. Well, thank you so much, Julianne. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll keep, on, keep on talking with one another and keep moving on. <laughs> that sounds great. Thanks, Jason. Thanks.